Welcome to In Focus. I'm going to have to place tonight's topic under the category of really bad ideas, because what I want to talk to you about is a really bad idea that came up during a science conference recently regarding the use of AI, artificial intelligence, uh, like chat GPT. We all know that chat GPT can be used to write, to write books, to write papers, to write music, to write songs, very controversial uh, about how it's being used. This is a perfect example of a technology that's developed faster than the values or the morals of how that technology is being used. And that's going to work its way through our society. We're going to figure that out. The idea that was proposed in this science conference was to use AI to rewrite the Bible uh, for a number of reasons. And I'm going to share a video clip with you here in just a moment and a little slide presentation of why I believe it's such a bad idea. But one of the statements made in the video is that it would be an opportunity to get religion correct, implying that for some reason, the religions that we have today are incorrect. And also, it was implied that the religions of today were all created by humankind, and that the religions, the great religions of the world, have always talked about uh, a non-human source for the religious text, the time when a non-human source would make those texts available, and the suggestion was that AI may be that non-human source. Well, who is to say that the religious texts that we have today were not created by a non-human source, at least some of them? And I think you'll see what I mean here in just a moment. Now, I want to be really clear about where I'm coming from. There's a context within which all this is happening. This isn't just out of the blue. And the context is that we are living a time of extremes, you all know that for a lot of reasons, and I've talked about that in a number of other videos, we're also living a time that is being called the time of the Great Reset. Uh, some people think it's a conspiracy, some people don't take it very seriously. The bottom line to the Great Reset is it is a proposal and a series of policies that will remake the world between now, 2023, uh, is the year this is being made, and the year 2030. That's not much time. What that means is that there's going to be an effort to reshape the world and to reshape our lives in ways that we have never seen between now and 2030. And the problem that I have with this idea is that there are things in the world that are unsustainable. There are things in the world that are broken. There are things in the world that are corrupt. We live in a world of broken and corrupt systems uh, that have been abused, good systems and power that has been abused through uh, through greed, through fear, uh, and we all know that. There's no secret around that. The problem with the Great Reset is it is coming from an organization that uh, is made of unelected officials. You and I did not ask these people to represent us. And this organization called the World Economic Forum, that I will talk in more detail about. I'm going to describe it in more detail in a separate video so we can stay on track with this one. I'm, uh, and I don't want to be redundant. But the whole principle of the World Economic Forum, these are uh, executives, um, leaders of nations, religious leaders, uh, scientific, technological leaders that have come together to share their ideas of what they believe a world should look like we didn't ask them to represent us, and we didn't ask them to put into place the policies that are going to reshape our lives, and that is precisely what's being done now. It's being done regarding climate. It's being done regarding global finance, global banking, the central bank digital currencies, World Health Organization. These aren't conspiracies. These are all policies uh, that uh, are either already exist or are being put into place, and lobbyists that are lobbying the governments of the nations that are involved to sign on to these principles. So it's all about moving the world toward greater levels of control, less freedom. Certainly, uh, there has to be less freedom because that is what leads to the greater control. The centralization of life, the centralization of food, of energy, of certainly monetary systems, and it's within this context that the proposal 
is coming out to centralized religion, to create a single new religion based on artificial intelligence. Uh, and as you'll see, the, the proposal is to, quote, correct the, the things that are incorrect in uh, the existing religions and the Bible specifically. Now, I want to talk about the Bible a little bit. You know, we talk about the Bible, we usually think about Christians. The Bible is a very complex document, is both a historical document, as well as a spiritual document, as well as the basis for entire religions. It serves those three purposes. There's an entire branch of archaeology called biblical archaeology, where individuals now, for the better part of a century and a half, have dedicated their lives to tracking down the clues left in the biblical text to the places in the world where things are said to have happened, and then they excavate to see if these things actually happened, uh, and many, many times they have. And this is biblical archaeology bearing out the traditions that many people thought were make-believe in the Bible, and you can go into the Holy Lands uh, and, and walk in the, the places that are referenced in, uh, in, in this, this text. The, when we say the Bible, the Bible means different things to different people. So the Hebrew Bible is based upon a book that is called the Torah. And the Torah are the biblical books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those first five books uh, are a complete Torah. When the Christian Bible was created, it incorporated the Torah into what we call the Old Testament in the Christian traditions. So you go to the King James Version of a Bible. Yeah, you're going to see Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You're seeing the Torah that was incorporated into the Old Testament and then additional books, additional documents, and then into the New Testament. A lot of people think that the Bible doesn't have anything to do with, uh, with Islam. Well, the, the historical figures and the historical events uh, in the Middle East that are referenced in the Bible are also shared and referenced in Islam, and Islam references uh, the, the biblical traditions not from the same principle and not from the in the New Testament and not the role of Jesus in the same way. But the bottom line is to rewrite the Bible would impact not only the Christian traditions, not only the Jewish traditions, but also Islam. And those traditions combined, I just have some numbers here, make up about 56% of the world's religion. Uh, billions of people are following traditions that are based in the biblical text, derived from those texts through either Islam or uh, Christianity or the, the Jewish tradition, the Hebrew traditions. So to rewrite this book would have a tremendous implications outwardly and intuitively to me. It just doesn't make sense. That's why I said I think it's a really bad idea. What I'd like to do is share with you technically, scientifically, deeper reasons why it's such a bad idea. Because there is something so unique about the Torah that exists in no other biblical book. Uh, it is a mystery that can, cannot be rip, replicated in, in any other religious tradition. And to rewrite the Bible would mean to rewrite this aspect of the Torah. So without uh, going into any more conversation here, what I'd like to do, let me share with you a very brief clip. It's only about 30 seconds where you can hear the, the gentleman who is proposing uh, in this uh, conference. It is a forum, and I want to be really clear on this. This is not a formal proposal in the World Economic Forum. The gentleman's name is Yuval Harari. Some of you are very familiar with him. He is affiliated with the World Economic Forum, and this is where it gets tricky because he's not actually a, a member. He contributes, and he has a lot of influence because his ideas shape the ideas of those who are members of the World Economic Forum. So Yuval Harari is speaking at a, a conference, and this is not a World Economic Forum conference, it's another conference, but it shows you where the thinking lies and the idea that, that even someone is even thinking of rewriting the Bible using AI, I think is just so 
so outrageous, not just a bad idea. It's a, it's a very frightening idea. Uh, and I want to share with you the reasons why. So let's begin with the film clip. And then I'm going to go into a little presentation about the Torah and how the rewriting of the Torah uh, would would influence over 56% of the people practicing uh, the world's religions today. So when we talk about Yuval Harari, one of the first questions that uh, that comes up is, who is he? And we could probably do a, a whole program to answer that question. And I will speak about him in another video where we're talking about the relationship between the World Economic Forum, United Nations, and a lot of uh, governmental policies. He was born in 1976. Uh, he is called a historian and a social philosopher. So this gives you some idea of where his thinking is. And I want to be really clear, when, when I have these conversations with you, you know my premise. How can we solve the problems if we're not honest about the problems? This isn't about making someone wrong or even making them out to be bad. What we're looking at are technocrats, and Yuval Harari is, uh, is an advocate of technology for sure and the introduction of technology into our world and even into our bodies. So we're talking about people who are really focused on technology and what is possible with technology. However, my experience as a scientist in the scientific community is often the scientists and the technologists are so myopic. They're so zeroed in on accomplishing a technological goal which uh, which can be done. And then you ask them, well, what are the implications of that goal? What does it mean to society? What does it mean to a family? What does it mean to, you know, to a civilization? And they'll say, you know, but that's that's above my pay grade. I'm, I'm not thinking about that. I mean, they'll literally say things like that. So they'll say, well, you know, let someone else figure that out. We're just looking at, at the technology and what's possible. So when we have this conversation, and we're listening to Yuval Harari. Number one, either he has not thought this through or he has thought it through and has simply discounted the, the disastrous implications that can come from this. I don't know him. I've never met him. And I don't know which camp he is in. I want you to be aware of what it is that he's saying, because this is one piece of a bigger puzzle. And you're going to be hearing more about this. So the image that you see on your screen right now, this is Yuval Harari. And uh, let's listen to to this clip. And again, the clip is coming from a, it was kind of like a TED, it wasn't TED, but it was like a TED talk kind of science forum that was held in 2023. The difference uh, between this and a TED talk is that in this forum, it was a conversation with an interviewer, whereas a TED talk typically is one person doing a presentation. So here's Yuval talking about the use of AI uh, in religion. Um, AI can create new ideas, can even write a new Bible. We, you know, throughout history, religions dreamt about having a book written by a superhuman intelligence, by a non-human entity. Every religion claims our book, all the other books of the other religions, they, humans wrote them. But our book, no, 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 no. It came from some superhuman intelligence. In a few years, there might be religions that are actually correct, that just think about a religion whose holy book is written by an AI. Yeah, and what he thinks is a really good idea, and you can see he is very passionate about this, uh, to me is a really bad idea. I want to share with you why the foundational book of 56% of the world's religion, I believe, was written, or at least crafted. I can't say that it was written. It was crafted uh, and it originated with a non-human intelligence. And I feel certain about that because of what this document is able to accomplish. It appeared on earth. The Torah first appeared on earth about 3,000 years ago. So everything I'm going to say to you uh, as far-fetched and as advanced as it sounds today in today's technological world, it's from a book that appeared 3,000 years ago, and we still don't know exactly where this book came from. So let me just talk about this a little bit. What uh, Harari is saying right here is key points. Number one, he said AI might be the answer to the ancient religions describing a holy book originating from a non-human or superhuman intelligence. I believe that uh, our Bible and the Torah specifically meets that criteria. 
AI may produce a religion that is actually correct. And what he's implying here is that religions that we have today are incorrect. Each religion fulfills a, a different role. But in a world, in a world where we are being uh, motivated and in some cases forced toward centralization, the only way to accomplish that is to break the social bonds that have kept us together as families, communities, societies, as nations, and as a planet. And those social bonds are systematically being broken, and I've described that in other, other videos. Uh, the social bond of religion is one of the last bonds that remains intact. So I'm not surprised that the thinking would be to somehow remake religions as we move toward this, this centralized way of, of thinking and living between now and the year 2030. I'm, I just want to say the, the change required to meet that criteria is a level of psychological and emotional and mental change, unlike anything in a time frame that is so compressed, humans aren't set up to accomplish what it is that's being proposed here. So AI Bible, why is this a really bad idea? As I mentioned, the Bible, when they say the Bible, they're talking about the Bibles that we know today uh, that are either based in uh, or or are or include the Torah, so that, those first five books. There's a mystery about the Torah that scientists are grappling with right now because it is so outrageous. What, what the Torah implies is so outrageous. And this mystery came to the scientific forefront in 1994. Now, there have always been rabbis for hundreds of years in the past that have always said that underlying the words in the Torah that we read as the letters on the page, there are coded, there's a deeper, a deeper tradition, a deeper message that can only be known to initiates that understand the codes. And as you'll see, the Torah itself says that its codes will be locked until the end of time when computers, and the word computer is actually coded into the Torah, when computers can open that code, when computers can unlock the code. So rabbis for hundreds of years have been trying to unlock this code by hand. It said some of them went insane by candlelight, you know, spending days with pieces of parchment and, and quill pens trying to unlock these mysterious codes. Well, it was in the mid-1990s when computers became more accessible to universities. You know, we take them for granted today. But it was in the, the mid-80s, I was working in the, the defense industry when computers were shifting from machines that took up entire rooms to something on a desktop uh, that could be used by an individual. And it was during that time, no surprise, that scientists began using computers uh, in innovative ways. And in this case, Israeli scientists were using the computers to unlock the codes in the Torah. 1994, there was a paper published in a peer-reviewed journal called Statistical Science. Uh, I'll read to you the title, and then we'll talk about what that means. The title is Equidistant Letter Sequences in the Book of Genesis. And the the bottom line is that there is a way to read the biblical texts that when we read the texts using what are called skip codes or equidistant letter sequences, and again, I'm going to describe these in just a moment, uh, that deeper meanings are, are revealed. So in 1994, that paper was produced, very controversial, so controversial that in 1997, a very famous experiment was run to either prove for once and for all, or disprove for once and for all that there's something going on with the Torah. The idea was to take the names of 34 famous rabbis uh, in Jewish history, and uh, if they existed, as we believe, then they should be noted in this secret code in the Torah. Now, I just wanted to note here that what the rabbis have always said about the Torah is that it is essentially a quantum map of time. All that has ever happened in the world, all that has ever been, all that is, all that will be 
is already encoded into this document that appeared on Earth 3,000 years ago. It's a quantum map of all possibilities. So this is what the, the scientists were struggling with. So they said, okay, if we put in these 34 famous rabbis, uh, let's see if their names are in there. Well, not only were their names in there, but the Torah identified the place of their birth, the place of their death, the years of their birth. And what makes this especially credible is the experiment was conducted by a man named Harold Gans. He was the former senior cryptologic mathematician for the US NSA, the National Security Agency, the, the top secret security agency, the cryptologic agency that uh, is, is dealing with so much of the, the AI and things like that that we're seeing today. So the Torah for this experiment, it exceeded the expectations. It didn't just reveal the names. It revealed the locations, the dates of the birth, dates of the death, cities where they lived, and all of these things. Uh, and now the scientists were left with the question, how could the book 3,000 years ago, the Torah, have known about this information, number one. Number two, this is where it gets really interesting. What else is encoded in that Torah? So that began a, a series of experiments that continue to this day. So let me talk to you a little bit about how information is encoded into the Torah, and then let's look at some of the codes that have been revealed. And I think you begin to see why it would be a really bad idea to use AI to rewrite the Bible when the first five books of the Bible include this mysterious document that we call the Torah. So I'm going to begin uh, every alphabet that has ever existed in the history of the world, without exception, has always been linked to two, two levels of information. One is the information revealed through the words and the letters as we read them uh, with the naked eye. All right. Secondly, every letter has always been linked to a mysterious number. No one knows for sure where the numbers came from. The numbers never change. They are constant. And it is through the mathematic sequences of the written words that the computer is able to, to reveal deeper information in the Torah. So what you're seeing on the screen right now, there's the Hebrew letters, and then there are the values of those letters. Now, some people will call this numerology, and I want to be clear, it is not. It is actually an ancient science called gematria that was defined by 32 rabbinical rules in the second century. So in the second century, there's a rabbi that identified 32 rules. If you're going to work in gematria or sometimes called gematria, you must follow these rules. Numerology is a later subset of the gematria and is a looser subset. Uh, numerology does not always follow all the, the rabbinical rules, those 32 rules. So it takes a little bit more liberties. So uh, so this is what we're looking at. And every, every alphabet, uh, English, cuneiform, Sanskrit, um, uh, Chinese, Arabic, I mean, every, every language that has ever been created has these numbers. Some are acknowledged more than others. So what happens with the Torah code? And this is going to go back to the original interpretation of the Torah and how it was received. If you watch Charlton Heston movies <laughs> back in the, in the 60s and 70s, ingrained in our minds, those of us old enough to have seen those, we see Charlton Heston coming down from Mount Sinai after he had an encounter with God. And in each arm, he's got a huge tablet of stone engraved with the Ten Commandments, uh, but also it was said during that time the Torah was revealed to him. So this is the way we typically think about this. New interpretations of the text now suggest the entire Torah was encoded into a crystalline substance, not necessarily a crystal, but a crystalline substance that fit into the palm of a single hand. And when the Ark of the Covenant is revealed and made public, we will see uh, that is the case. The way the Torah uh, was revealed is that it is said to have come in a continuous string of letters, no punctuation, 
no spaces, a continuous string of information. And it's with that in mind that the computer scientist converted the Torah that we see today, every letter of the Torah, into its number equivalent. All right. And what they have is a matrix. And it's a matrix. It's a, a computer matrix held in the memory of, of the computer, a total of 304,805 numbers. Exactly. The Torah has exactly 304,805 letters. And that's a very significant number. Those of you that study the Torah, you know that. The computer scientist arranged these numbers in the way that is believed the Torah was received on Sinai into a matrix with no spaces, no punctuation, 64 rows of 4,772 numbers each. This is the way it is believed that the Torah was originally originally received in the Kabbalistic, the deep Kabbalistic traditions. You don't hear a lot about this typically, uh, but I want to share this with you so you can see why it's so important not to rewrite the Torah. All right. Now, we're all familiar with a 2D matrix. And, and when you look at a, a Bible with the naked eye, that's what you're seeing is a 2D matrix. You're seeing the X axis goes across the sentences, or if you're reading in Hebrew, it goes from, from right to left, and then top of the page to down, just kind of like the matrix, you know, in the movie you're seeing on the screen. Here's what happened. The computer scientists were able to arrange the information in the Torah into not a two-dimensional matrix, but a multi-dimensional matrix, and not just any old kind of a matrix, what is called a dynamic multi-dimensional matrix. Let me explain what that means. So on the screen, what you're seeing, here's a two-dimensional matrix of parts of the Torah converted into the numbers, no punctuation and no letters. All right, that's a two-dimensional matrix. Now, this is kind of a mind blower. In a dynamic matrix, what happens is the arrangement of all of the information in that matrix, it identifies a path. Some people would call this a timeline. If you're following the information on, on the, time, the, the quantum timelines that we are following as we barrel down the road uh, toward the end of, of the cycle that we're living in, we live a timeline. And you live a timeline. We have our personal timelines, and then they all merge into collective timelines for families and communities and societies that merge into collective timelines for nations and for a planet. So there are timelines within timelines within timelines, all right? Now, the matrix of the Torah represents those timelines, but here's the mind blower. The dynamic part of the matrix is every time a choice is made, the entire matrix has to rearrange itself to accommodate that choice to formulate the new quantum possibilities that now are available because that choice was made. So for example, you I just use a, a silly example here. You are in high school and you have a high school sweetheart. All right, and you two come together as, as partners in high school, okay? Now, your personal timelines have now merged into a collective timeline, and you begin uh, in, in a, a quantum reality, quantum possibilities. If you stay together, and if you have children together, and you spend your entire life together, that is one quantum timeline. But if you're together 10 years, and then you break up, and you end up going with someone else, now you've branched off of that timeline. So the possibilities in your life have just shifted because you are no longer with the energy of that same person. So your timelines have shifted. Now that, I think we all can wrap our minds around that. The mind blower is that the Torah matrix accounts for those shifts Every time one of us makes a choice in our lives, the entire matrix, energetically, it has to rearrange itself to accommodate that. And there are about 8 billion people on the planet, so 8 billion timelines are being accommodated. This matrix began 3,000 years ago, so there is a 3,000-year 
uh, a timeline that is being accommodated here, and all this is being done in the computer. This is the dynamic nature of this not only multi-dimensional, but a hyper-dimensional matrix. And that's what I'm illustrating here on the screen right now. The matrix is so complex that it not only accommodates every choice that we make, but as we make those choices, it lays out the quanta potential for every choice that is now possible based upon all the choices that we just made. This is in a document that appeared on Earth 3,000 years ago. And when the scientists began the experiments with the Torah, uh, they discovered what I'm saying to you right now. And they said, okay, well, maybe this is just a fluke. You know, as crazy as it is, maybe it's, maybe it's just lucky. Let's see if it works in any other documents. And they, they took books like War and Peace and like Moby Dickens and like the, the phone, the telephone books from from large cities. And they converted all of those into numbers and loaded all of those into the, the computer multi-dimensional dynamic hyper-dimensional matrices. <laughs> Say that five times in a row and uh, and not, not have a smile on your face when you're doing it. And the bottom line is no other document produce the kinds and the quality of information that we're going to get into. I'm going to show you is that some, if you've never seen this, I think you're going to be pretty amazed at what you see. The point here is it is only possible because of the way the letters are arranged in this book that was given to the people of the earth 3,000 years ago that's the basis for 56% of the world's major religions. Even though the religions may not see eye to eye with one another, they have their foundation in a common history in those first five books. You don't want to rewrite those books. You don't want to rewrite, especially not with AI. And I'll, I'll tell you why in just a moment. All right. So now we're talking about a hyper dimensional matrix. Every choice that's made has to change that entire matrix. This is very, very complex computer science, as, as you can imagine. Um, by the way, I uh, am supposed to have the opportunity to meet one of the authors of this study uh, when I am in the Holy Lands uh, at the end of this year, 2023. And it, it, should that meeting go forward as planned, I will share with you an update and a video as well. So why? What is, what is the purpose of converting the Torah and the numbers, putting those numbers into this multidimensional, hyperdimensional matrix? Well, the answer is then the computers can do the searches uh, through computer algorithms that the uh, rabbis used to try to do by hand and, and went crazy doing. The computers don't go crazy. It's a piece of cake for the computers. Once you give them the algorithm, they can search. And they're searching the matrix with what is called, we mentioned this earlier, ELS sequences, equidistant letter sequences. So let me show you quickly what one of these searches look like then I will illustrate what an ELS, an equidistant letter search, is. Then we'll get into the juicy stuff. We'll get into some of the correlations and relationships that have been found uh, encoded into the Torah. And they'll make sense to you because you now understand where they're coming from. So what you're seeing on the screen is a, uh, a screenshot, a snapshot from one of the programs that runs the search. And what happens is the... First of all, the queries have to be made in the Hebrew language because that's the language that the document was received in. If it was received in cuneiform, you know, we'd be querying in, in cuneiform. So the query has to come in the Hebrew language. And what happens is the computer then will search within a given distance, and we define, the user defines, what is called a statistically significant distance. I know this might sound a little technical to some people, but I want I want you to see how this works. It's not hocus pocus. Uh, I mean, this is peer reviewed science. So they define a range within which information is going to be statistically meaningful, and the computer will search vertically on the y axis, horizontally on the x axis, and diagonally on what is called the z axis as well. And when it has a hit, it will do what you're seeing on the screen right now. And so if you query for the name Greg, for example, and by the way, my name 
is in this matrix, and so is yours. Every name of every human who's ever walked the earth is in this matrix. And we've done live events where we've input the names of the people and, and everybody that gave a name, their name is in there. Uh, date of birth, you know, where they're from, all of those kinds of, we're all in there. All that is, all that has ever been, or all that, all that is, all that has been, all that is, and all that will ever be is encoded into this document. That's the mind blower because we don't even have the technology to do something like that today. So it it would come up looking like what you're seeing right now. So when we get into this, you'll you'll know what it is that you're looking at. Uh, let's talk about an ELS. What is an electronic skip sequence? It is a number that is selected by you, the user. You tell the computer to begin with the letter T, for example, for Torah. This is an example I'm going to give you in just a moment. The computer looks for the first appearance of the letter T, and then you give the computer the skip code uh, for the next letter that you're looking for to find some meaningful information. So the skip code determines how many letters you go over. For example, in the book of Genesis, the ancient rabbis discovered a skip code of 50. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Uh, by the way, uh, once again, Hebrew is, is read from right to left. So when you look into the Torah, and the letter A is uh, the vowels are not used in the Hebrew language uh, as vowels. They're indicated through the, the, the dots, but they're not, they're not written out. So the letter A you're not going to find in the word Torah. So this first book of the Bible. So here it is. The letter T, there's the, the first letter T that appears. Now you, you do a skip code of 50, and the next letter just happens to be O. Now, is that a coincidence or not? This is the way it's encoded. Then you skip 50 more letters, and you've got the word, the letter R, and 50 more, and you've got the letter H. So a skip code of 50 in the book of Genesis reveals the name of the book that you are reading. It, it is the Torah, and it reveals more from there. So this illustrates how a skip code works. You can use different, you can use 10, 5, you can use any number for a skip code, all right? This information was first revealed to the public in 1997 in a New York Times bestselling book. Uh, and I was working as a senior computer scientist in the defense industry. The company at that time was called Martin Marietta Defense Systems. Now it is Lockheed Martin. And there's uh, other videos I've talked about why I ended up there. I didn't apply for the job. I was placed there because of uh, expertise that I had. And uh, I don't want to be redundant again, but this is when this book came out. And it was a mysterious book. The reason the book was such a splash is because it was written by uh, Michael Drosden, by the way, who just passed recently. Uh, unfortunately, he's, he's no longer with us. He was a journalist. Michael Drosden understood the skip codes. He understood the Torah codes. And what happened was that he went to the mathematicians that had developed these codes and written that paper in statistical science. And they found that the prime minister of Israel at that time, his name was Yitzhak Rabin. The Torah code said that if Yitzhak Rabin went to a certain location on a certain date that was encoded into the Torah and, and gave a talk on that date that he would be assassinated, and Michael Drazen said, we need to let Yitzhak Rabin know this. So they did. And Rabin was a, a deep believer, a very a deeply spiritual man. And he said, you know, if it's written in the Torah, then it's meant to be. I'm not going to change my plans. He went to the location uh, on the date at the time. He turned down the street that was indicated in the Torah and a lone assassin. It's believed to be a lone assassin. Uh, did assassinate Yitzhak Rabin exactly as revealed in the Torah 3,000 years before it ever happened. He was assassinated November 5th, 1995. The reason for his assassination was because he, along with uh, Sadat, were working toward peace as the representative of uh, Prime Minister of Israel and um, uh, Sadat, not Sadat, Sadat was Egyptian, uh, Yasser Arafat. 
is who you're seeing here. Yasser Arafat represented the Palestinians. These two men wanted peace. And uh, Bill Clinton facilitated the meeting between them at the time. And the closest that we've ever come to a peace deal in the Middle East was between these two men. However, there was a faction of individuals on both sides that did not want the peace because there were concessions that were made to achieve that peace, and they didn't want those concessions. And Yitzhak Rabin lost his life because of the concessions he made trying to achieve peace in the Middle East. Uh, Yasser Arafat was not assassinated. He died later on. He never was able to get close to that deal again. That was, uh, many people say it was the closest we've, we've ever come. Here is the Torah code that reveals, this is what Michael Drosnan saw that took him to Yasser Arafat. It revealed that this is going to happen before it ever did. And now you can think back to what I said earlier in this conversation. One query is indicated in red. Another query is indicated in blue. And you can see where they're intersecting here uh, indicates that they are, they are related. Yitzhak Rabin, the name Yitzhak Rabin was entered into the computer and it showed up vertically in red. And that's what you're seeing. Uh in the blue was the word assassin. And what ended up showing up was assassin who will assassinate. This is what you're seeing in the blue. And they actually cross one another right here. So you're, you're seeing this. It was encoded, again, 3,000 years before it happened, but it didn't stop there. Look at how much further it went. What we see in another query as the uh, the people that were working with the code as they ask deeper questions. What we see in kind of a, with a flat topped pyramid, the name of the assassin uh, is indicated in the diamond shape. His name was Amir and Amir was the, the man that assassinated Yitzhak Rabin. In the square, the name of the assassin who will assassinate uh, and then the name Yitzhak Rabin. So you can see that these all either intersect or are they, they are what is called within statistically significant range of this matrix. This is a divine matrix that we're seeing here made of the Torah. So this is the information that uh, Michael Drosnan took to Yitzhak Rabin. Yitzhak Rabin said, if it's in the Torah, it must be, it's God's will. And he went forward and it happened just as it was, as it was written here. Now the investigators did a little experiment after the assassination happened. And they said, what if Yitzhak Rabin had chosen not to go? What if he listened to the warning and he didn't go? The Torah code, I don't have it on the screen, but the Torah code came up and said, uh, assassination delayed. Assassination delayed. So it's not that it wasn't going to happen. It just wouldn't have happened at the same time. So how, how could this be? This is, uh, uh, I'm going to give you a series of examples of information that's encoded into the Torah. I'm just going to tell you right now, everything that is queried uh, is encoded in the Torah. The names of all the great wars of the world, what countries entered, uh, the year they entered, the years the wars ended, who the leaders of the country were, the birth dates of the leaders, when the leaders died. And it's not just bad things, good things have happened as well. Uh, the election of presidents, you'll see Obama uh, is encoded in here. Uh, uh, Clinton was encoded in here. Uh, Trump is encoded for his first election, was in the, the Torah codes. Now, I, I want to say something here. I'm going to be really clear about this. The Torah code does not predict what will happen. So you can't say what's going to happen in a certain year. You have to enter the key words and the Torah will show you those words and how they're related to other events because they are all possible. And this is why this is so important. It appears to be a quantum map of all possibilities, not what must happen, but what may happen if nothing changes the events. So for example, when after the fact, when the, the word atomic holocaust was entered into the Torah code. Now, and I put this in here intentionally because I want you to see this. A lot of people are afraid that we're going to have an atomic war in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, between Russia and America and, and Ukraine. I'm not saying it's impossible for it to happen, 
what I'll say is that the Torah only identifies two places uh, in history where the word atomic holocaust comes up. One of them is right here, the Jewish year 5705 or the uh, Julian year 1945. 1945 uh, is are the squares and the circle atomic holocaust look at they they intersect right there what country japan and you see that in the diamonds and the statistically significant uh, distance from when this happened so that did happen and we know that this was hiroshima this was nagasaki three three days later the other place uh for the atomic holocaust was during the cold war in the 1980s and there were events that changed that outcome. And we don't see anywhere in the Torah codes, in the Bible codes, the word atomic holocaust again. Now, it doesn't mean that we couldn't have a nuclear, a limited exchange, as they're talking about. One side, you know, lobs what's called a, a tactical nuke or something like that. But the holocaust, where you see many mushroom clouds on the horizon wiping out entire civilizations does not come up again in the in the Torah codes. And I, to me, I think that's good news. And I wanted to share that with you. Kennedy's assassination was in here 3,000 years before it happened. When they entered the name President Kennedy, and you see it in the circle, it links into the words to die. And then right next to that in the diagonal is the city Dallas, where it happened. How did the Torah no, to link that information together. Then they went deeper, and here it is. Oswald was the name of the assassin. Now, there may be others involved, but Oswald is the one that was identified. Uh, he was a marksman, and you see that in the, the triangles, and, and he was. Name of assassin who will assassinate. Very similar to Yitzhak Rabin. They did the same thing here, and you see that in, in the square. Again, 3,000 years before it happened. 9-11. There's all kinds of Torah uh, codes about September 11th, how it happened. Here you see in the circles, twin towers, right next to that in the in the diamonds or, or, or the word towers, it knocked down twice and then you see airplane off onto the side. And here's a, a more detailed color-coded uh, Torah sample where you can see the words murder, twin tower, attack, thousands, the word bin Laden comes up there as well. Uh, so on the right-hand side of the screen, in the color is translated what you see on the left-hand side of the screen in color. Uh, and the right-hand side, it's in English, and the left-hand side, it's in Hebrew. So you can see how all of this worked. Uh, Obama's election. Here it is right here. Barack Obama, his name. You see it in the blue. Uh, president, you see that in the pink. In the USA, in the red, you see in the bottom. Uh, your father, which is very interesting because he wrote a book uh, about his father, uh, Islamic, uh, is uh, intersects horizontally uh, right above the name Barack Obama. Uh, so you see this revealed in the, the Torah code, the origin of humans. I mean, this it goes on and on. We could spend all night on this. The origin of humans. Where did we come from? What you can see uh, when that was entered was DNA spiral. In Adam was the model, the template from a code, and you see where these things inter intersect, suggesting that we're not the product of random evolutionary processes, as I have said for 40 years. The evidence doesn't support that. The DNA evidence doesn't support that. One of the things, and I'm just going to show you this, this last one, what we see in the biblical text is that we are barreling down the road towards some kind of outcome, and you feel the events are accelerating. Feels like what people say a rubber band is being stretched so tight, something's got to give. From the biblical perspective, that give is a, a last great battle that will happen uh, on the plains of what is called Armageddon near Megiddo in the Holy Lands. When you query this in the Bible, this is really interesting. Armageddon, Megiddo, Mount Megiddo. And by the way, if you're with us on any of our trips to the Holy Lands, we go to these places so we can stand and, um, and have our experiential processes at these places. But what it says is Assad Holocaust. Assad, of course, is the president of, uh, of Syria. 
there's a lot of tension that is happening. There's a, a war that is happening in Syria, essentially a proxy war between the U.S. and Russia um, in Syria right now. Uh, it said Assad Holocaust shooting from the military post. This is interesting because the Israelis have the high point looking down into Syria from what is called the Golan Heights. Uh, and it says this is where the Battle of Armageddon will occur. The reason I want you to see this, look at what this says. Look at what I showed you in red uh, uh, up here. Well, first of all, it says it was supposed to happen. It could have happened in the year 2000. It says it was delayed. So we did not have this Armageddon battle in the year 2000. But look at this. Look at this. In the year 1996, there were, you see the squares right there highlighted in red, are words that you will see come up in many of the Bible codes. And I think this is the reason I'm uh, uh, for this whole conversation. And those words say they're talking about a Holocaust, a Holocaust of Israel. You delayed it. And what they say is, will you change it? There's a message encoded with some of the great, the, the most horrible tragedies you could ever imagine that are identified. When, when you put the words in, they come up and they say, yeah, they're a possibility. But then the code comes up and look at what it says. Will you change it? This implies that this code is not predicting what will happen. It is a map of possibilities, a map of potential, and that we always have choice. We always have free will. And I wanted you to see that here. Will you change it invites us to shift that timeline, to, to make choices so that the timeline leading the Holocaust doesn't happen. The same thing happens with the atomic Holocausts of the world, the great battles of the world, all of the horrible things you could imagine. Will you change it? It's up to us. We have a choice. So I wanted you to see this. I want you to see this because your name, as I mentioned, your name is in the Torah codes. Every name of every human I've ever entered is in the Torah codes. We're all in there because we're all in this together. Now, I want to stay focused on the reason I'm sharing this with you. There was a proposal for AI to rewrite the Bible. That would mean that AI rewrites the first five books of the Bible. That would mean that AI is rewriting the Torah. The Torah is a mysterious book of supernatural origin. It has to be, because not even the best scientists today can create the dynamic, hyper-dimensional computer matrix that accommodates all of the choices and rearranges the matrix for individuals and collectively all at the same time, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of million times a day this is happening what intelligence created this? I don't know the answer to that, but it wasn't humans. So we already have a document from non-human or superhuman intelligence. We're only beginning to understand what it means. To rewrite the Bible would mean to rewrite that text or possibly to discount that text altogether. That is a really bad idea for all the reasons I've just shared. Another thing that I want to say here. And I mentioned this in, I uh, don't want to be too redundant, but this was in a, a previous video about artificial intelligence itself. AI operates on the algorithms created by humans. Those algorithms reflect the bias of the person creating the algorithms, what they believe to be true, what their fears are. And then the AI goes out into the World Wide Web and it collects information that information is the product of all the censorship and all the bias that we have had, at least since the year 2020. So the AI that is proposed to rewrite the Bible, it's already skewed. It's already biased. That's not the AI you want to write the spiritual traditions for half or all of the world's religious traditions. So this is where I wanted to go with this, you know. I mentioned earlier, and this is so powerful, in the book of Daniel, it actually says that the Torah is a code and that the code is sealed until the end of time. Here it is right here in the, the blocks uh, horizontal on the x-axis to shut up the words and seal the book 
until the end of time. The word time is cut off on the right-hand side. But look at what is in the circles, computer. The computer is what unlocks these codes. We now have the technology and we have the knowledge to unlock the codes that were left to us over 3,000 years ago. They were given to the people in the Middle East to preserve to the Jewish people, not for them to hoard, but to preserve for all of humankind until the end of time when we could open those codes and reveal them to the world. And this is why in the, the Hebrew traditions, every Torah that was created by hand, if one letter was miswritten, it said it could change the world forever. If one letter changed and people said, well, that's crazy. How could that be? You can see now how that could be because one letter would change the information that's contained in the Torah. In my humble opinion, there's some things that we don't want to mess with. And the Bible is one of those things. The world's religions, the last bastion of social coherency that brings us together I think is worth preserving. You know, Albert Einstein said very famously that time does not flow only in one direction and that the future exists simultaneously with the past. The Torah tells us that this is true, not as a religious document, but as a highly advanced, technologically sophisticated matrix of quantum possibilities that appeared on this planet 3,000 years ago and can serve us today, we have the knowledge and we have the technology. The question is, do we have the wisdom? The deeper question that we ask so many times, do we love ourselves enough to allow for the possibilities revealed through the Torah in our lives? Do we love ourselves enough to embrace the deep truth of what is revealed without judging who has preserved it or where it comes from? We're not going to have to wait long to find out how we answer that question because the heat is on, the pressure's on to know what is revealed in the Torah and to preserve it in the presence of AI uh, rather than allow the AI to rewrite some of the most ancient and cherished traditions that right now are the basis of 56% of the world's population and the religions they believe in. So once again, some things we don't want to mess with. The Bible is one of them for these reasons. Thank you for sharing a little bit of your day or your evening with me. I'm going to stop here. And uh, there may be a part two to this. We'll see how you respond. Let me know in the comments how you feel about what we've shared. This is going to bring a close to this in focus.